I've seen a trend in seminaries to uh, reduce the level of uh, language yeah. requirement. Yeah, right. And it's the same kind of problem that we're talking about at a seminary level is if we reduce the language requirement all the while giving more systematic theology or curriculum that is like systematic theology, a given topic, we're telling people what to believe mm. instead of teaching them how to oh, learn. That's so good. That's so true. And, and then what happens if we've yep. learned that way in seminary, we do that with our people. Mm. Because what we, how we learned is what we bring into the pulpit. Mm. Welcome to Pastor and Scholar, Bridging the Gap, examining issues from both a pastoral and academic perspective. I am Chris Miller, your moderator. Joining me, as always, is Ryan Day, founding pastor of Revolve Bible Church, and Dr. Corey Marsh, author, editor, and professor of New Testament at Southern California Seminary. Joining us this episode is Dr. Ryan Rippey, president of the Cornerstone Bible College and Seminary in Vallejo, California. He also serves as professor of church history and theology at Cornerstone, as well as pastors Trinity Church of Venetia, which he planted in 2022. Dr. Rippey holds a Master of Divinity from the Cornerstone Seminary and a PhD from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. His published works include Preaching That Exalts Christ, The Pulpit Ministry of St. Fernandez, who was the founding president of Cornerstone, and That God May Be All in All, A Biblical Examination of the Role of God the Father Within the Trinity. We are pleased to have him mm. with us. Welcome, Dr. Rippey. Thank you. Now, on this episode, we will be discussing the role of the pulpit. And particularly in America today, the pulpit has become less about preaching the Word of God than about entertaining congregants, addressing felt needs, offering motivational talks, highlighting current events in politics, and just outright storytelling. Less and less time seems to be devoted to actually opening up Scripture and examining it. And just given these trends, I know as president of your seminary, the Cornerstone Seminary, um, what are you doing in terms of training up pastors? What is your educational philosophy? Yeah, so what we desire to do is we have a pastor-professor model at our seminary. Mm -hmm. So all of our professors are pastors of local churches. We currently have 22 professors from 18 different churches around the San Francisco Bay Area and up into Sacramento. And the goal is to give a theological education that is like a vocational school uh, the journeyman experience of these professors, many of them, our average uh, experience is over 20 years in pastoral ministry, uh, along with theological rigor uh, uh, to train pastors to love and shepherd the flock. Mm. So one of the main means that we do is we give them uh, detailed education in the biblical languages, hermeneutics, exposition, so that they're able to take the Word of God into the pulpit to uh, have a Christ-centered expository preaching that takes the sufficiency and supremacy of Christ and brings it to the needs of their people. And so, th- and so expository preaching for us is one of the tools that, that we want our uh, graduates to use to love and shepherd the flock of God. As a pastor, that's what they're called to do. And uh, we are convinced that expository preaching is the means of feeding the flock Sunday to Sunday. Amen. Mm-hmm. Would you say that would be the way that we can reclaim the pulpit is getting back to that? Absolutely. Um, you know, there's been a, a long history. I teach a history of American preaching class at our seminary, and we go from the colonies all the way to the present right. day. Mm. And we've had a, you know, over 100 years of an essay format that came out of the Puritan model, but what it did was it took a proof text. The Puritans would do this. Mm -hmm. They would develop a doctrine, and then they would have some use at the end, some application. In the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, it turned to an essay model, and what happened was proof texting became the pattern still, though, not Mm -hmm. expository preaching. Mm -hmm. And then in the 20th century, this blossomed into a whole reverse-engineered method of preaching uh, you have the felt needs movement that arised, all, all sorts of things that came up. And so this return in the last couple decades to expository preaching is a much needed corrective huh. in the pulpit. Hmm. Huh. Amen. That's interesting. I mean, how I mean, when you, hearing you say that, Ryan, I have heard so many expositors, quote unquote, that identify as expositors. And I'm, Ryan, I'm sure you can you can speak to this as well, who at the end of the day are just proof texting. 
you know, they're not actually explaining a pericope of scripture. Mm. They're taking one perhaps verse, maybe in a few words from that verse and just using it as a springboard to go elsewhere, but still calling it expository preaching. Yeah, a right? springboard sermon. You and I have talked extensively about this, that I'm so thankful for the, the resurgence of expository preaching that's occurring, uh, although it's not widespread as enough as it needs to be. But yeah. you and I have talked extensively about a lot of people that call themselves expositors aren't actually expositing the text. Right. They're not showing their people how they came to those conclusions and leading them through the actual right. passage. They're doing springboard sermons onto a theological right. uh, issue or hobby horse that they That's might right. have. I thought it was very interesting. I, I'd, uh, one of the things that we do here often at Pastor Scholar is I take the host from Chris. <laughs> he becomes my unofficial <laughs> co-host. Yeah, I see. <laughs> um, but one of the things I'd love to hear you talk about more is the Puritan model of preaching. I think a lot of people don't understand that and yeah, how they approach preaching. Yeah. I love reading the Puritans, so thankful for the Puritans, but they really approach preaching differently than what we would say is expository preaching today. You think that's an accurate statement? Absolutely. So what they were doing was doctrinal preaching. So they had a, a, a doctrine, reason, use outline. Um, and what they would do is they would take a very small text, then they would develop a systematic theology. Take Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, now he's late Puritan, arguably not Puritan, but he was using that same model. Their foot shall slip in due time mm -hmm. is the text. The sermon is a systematic theology of the doctrine of hell. That's right. The use, the application was flee to Christ. And it was used in the Great Awakening and the Lord used that sermon. And what's happened today is we have um, in, in our circles, in, in these conservative evangelical circles that love expository preaching, many of us have gone back to the Puritan model. A Lloyd Jones was a good example of this. Mm -hmm. He preached the Puritan model, so he's got six years in Ephesians and or whatever it was, long in Ephesians. And yeah. you look at those sermons and you say, they're not really expository. Mm -hmm. They're doctrinal sermons. Mm -hmm. And so in the name of expository preaching, some, I don't think that their motive is to just springboard into their own agenda. What they're looking at is I'm going to develop a systematic theology of a word study out of this mm -hmm. verse and go through all of Scripture. But then what it does is it takes it away from expository preaching, turns it into topical preaching, a good topic, arguably, in doctrine. Yeah. Now, but that, that, so that's uh, how the Puritans did it. Do you favor more, like, say, full paragraphs, pericope, like a top-down model? Or do you like to, uh, would you advocate for expository preaching like of, of a single verse or so? I mean, what, what do you prefer? What do you think is more helpful? Yeah, personally, I preach larger sections. Yeah. I, I feel like that gets to yeah. a thoral intent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I've been, there's been times where I've preached one verse, um, but I end up tying it to the surrounding context. Mm -hmm. um, so I may be giving in-depth exposition of the one verse, but I'm, I'm making mention of what comes before and what goes after. Mm. I think another area where um, it can feel topical, even if it started expository, is in the area of application. Mm. Uh, because take the book of Colossians, four chapters, first two chapters are primarily indicatives, mm -hmm. everything Christ has done. Second two chapters, primarily application. But pastors, if they're in chapter one, feel expository preachers sometimes feel like I can't go to chapter three and four for the application because we're not there yet. Right. Yeah, I'm going to ruin right. my future sermons. Uh, right. <laughs> right. right. Exactly. <laughs> yet that book was written to be read at one time. That's right. And right. Paul's application to what he said in one it's and two. Based on those indicatives. Is three and yeah, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right. And so we need to at least have Paul's intended application yeah. of setting your mind on things above, of all these things from chapters one and two. That's right. Now, I, I feel like that comment about preaching one verse versus a pericope was directed to me. Wait, yeah, wait, good. Wait, 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 wait. We need to define pericope for those who don't know what pericope <laughs> well, is. I, I seem like, so I use pericope a yeah. lot of times when he I preach. He loves the word pericope. My, my, my wife, she, she rolls her eyes. <laughs> Can't you just say paragraph or big section? I'm like, no, I'm an academic. I have to right. say pericope, right? That's what we do. It sounds cool. Anyways, pericope. It sounds yeah. cool, right? <laughs> or pericope is how it looks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're talking units of thought, you okay. know, an actual, an actual, a blocked out unit of scripture. You can tell that this is one paragraph 
paragraph, and this paragraph, so it's not it's not isolated verses. So per- pericope, layman's term, was, I guess, just paragraph or unit of thought. You know? Yeah. So yeah. if you think of a, a parable in the Gospels, that would be a pericope. That makes sense. It's a there unit of thought. The yeah. Unit of thought. Exactly. Now, I, I do think that there is a space in the church for doctrinal preaching. I yes. think that it helps our right. people think theologically and think. Uh, big ideas, if you would. I don't know if that's a good way to say it. So I do think that there's a place for doc- doctrinal preaching. Would you agree with that? I do. I think there is a place for that. Um, it, it's necessary. If we don't have doctrinal preaching, then our people can be muddy on how the individual texts tie to the overall hmm. system of thought um, of the of the of our doctrinal statement of our local church, for yeah. example. Mm-hmm. Now, when see, that's, that's what confused, sorry, Chris. Sorry. Now this is like, got my wheels. Well, no, no, it's definition this. of the terms. What, what is the difference between doctrinal preaching and expository preaching? Expository preaching um, would be what we think of in terms of verse by verse, the, the intent of the text is the intent of the sermon. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what Paul meant in Colossians or John meant in his epistle, uh, we're just letting the author verse by verse get the intent of that text to our people. Mm -hmm. Doctrinal preaching would then be uh, broadening the scope to a certain subject, maybe the doctrine of justification by faith alone, going through all of the scripture Mm -hmm. to show how they all weave together Mm -hmm. and how there's no contradictions and how the word is inerrant and trustworthy and sufficient and then applying justification to our people. And so it, it veers away from maybe... Paul's immediate intent in the book of Romans or Galatians. That's where it gets tricky because doctrinal preaching can then become topical. Correct. And it's like, what point, this is what the the homiletician has to deal with this, okay? For example, I I recently preached um, probably, I think at our church actually, not not too long ago, Romans chapter three. You got that 14 point, what I call human diagnostic of, you know, what someone called total depravity, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's no one good, no, not one. Mm -hmm. So at what point do you you exposit the text going verse by verse because he's quoting Psalms, he's quoting Isaiah, all these different things, and then go into this whole Calvinistic idea of of depravity. It fits the context and it's helpful, but am I now springboarding out of the text into a topic, Mm -hmm. into a a doctrine? You you mentioned Romans 3. That's a great text to talk about the need for doctrinal preaching. Paul is pulling from several places in the Old Testament, and he's putting uh, uh, quotes together, if right. you would, to lay out a case right. for our, our need for Christ's propitiation. But the moment you say, like I do, because I actually, I totally agree with the, the doctrine of total depravity. When you put that out there, and I've had students have problems with this, they immediately think, oh, Something that's else. Calvinistic. Yeah. Oh, uh, he's preaching Calvinism. Yeah. It's like, no, they don't own that's this a, term, a, but this is, point. but it's like, you, that's the problem when you go, that's the danger when you go into doctrinal preaching. Mm. People are used to these systematic categories um, as opposed to just, this is what Paul is talking about. Try to get Calvin out of your yeah. mind. This is what Paul is talking about. We call it total depravity. I think that works, but... Would you, Dr. Marsh, would you do, would you say that that expository preaching is, uh, is, is more in line with biblical theology versus systematic of course. theology? Oh, of course. But systematic theology also helps at the end to be able to coalesce these things so we can see a connection between these, the doctrine that the text itself is teaching, but we got to make a distinction between what the doctrine, what the text is, t- what doctrine it supports or teaches, and a distinction with what the text itself is saying. Because sometimes yeah, they're not the exact good. same, yeah. you know. And this, these are the things that are just tricky for a preacher who actually cares about the text to have to. Uh, Correct. You know, the mo- most people in the church don't even consider this. They're yeah. like, you know, my pastor gets up, he works forty minutes a, a week, maybe an hour, because all they know is what he's doing there, yeah. preaching, well, not yeah. realizing. What else, what else do you do? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even what he's doing, I can get up there and do that without even thinking about these things. Yeah. Um, when I teach theology of preaching at our seminary. Um, one thing I talk about is a distinction between what I call exegetical theology versus systematic mm-hmm. theology mm-hmm. out of Great. the text. And what is the difference between Ah, them? well, it's debated. Um, I'm not using exegetical theology in, in some technical sense, but what I'm trying to get them to see is if they're going to want to give a doctrinal preaching uh, to the point of Romans 3, that they're letting Paul's argument unfold in an exegetical form of theology rather than Let's talk Calvin's five points. Right, yep. right. Uh, Calvin's right. idea of let me let me take Paul's. a detour into a history lesson on the five points, the Synod mm-hmm. of Dort, etc., cetera, mm-hmm. etc. Cetera. I don't know that that's helpful on a Sunday morning from the pulpit as a steady diet. Uh-huh. Sunday schools, midweeks, yeah. home groups, right. great. That's a great place for doctrinal preaching. But what I try to get them to do is is start with the immediate context, 
broaden out to the chapter, the book as a whole. Then look if it's if it's John, look at all of John's writings. So do more of a a biblical theology of John, and then go from Genesis to Revelation. I love it. Mm-hmm. I love it. Of course, Great. the the weak side to biblical theology is that the sermons can sound the same every week. <laughs> yeah. Over time, yeah. that you're always re- repeating the story of redemptive history without locating, you know, getting to the specifics of the text you're actually in. I think that's a major problem in the Reformed world. I I see doctrinal preaching uh, being confused with expository preaching, but what actually happens in the life of the congregation is that people remain perpetually immature Mm -hmm. because they know doctrinal concepts, but they're not being pressed on the actual issues of the text. And and having those things applied to their mm-hmm. life. And the result is, and I know I'm making a very, very general statement, and I'm not trying to say that everybody who focuses on doctrinal preaching has an immature congregation. I'm just saying that the text is what the Holy Spirit uses to change us. And so when we're constantly hitting doctrines and we're avoiding the minutia of the text, we're actually having a negative impact on the transformation of our people. Would you guys I, agree I think that? that's what's so helpful, what Ryan just said, that distinction in exegetical theology as you defined it. And, and doctrinal preaching, because sometimes the text itself, we got to let just, just let, like say we're using Paul as an example, the Apostle Paul, let Paul speak for himself without bringing in these outside categories. That can help, that can help us systematize, synthesize these things, but sometimes the text doesn't so clearly support what we've been handed down through a tradition, you know, and oftentimes the mm. person in the pew or a student in the classroom they hear these challenges straight from the text, and then mm-hmm. sometimes, unfortunately, their their reaction is to just dig their theological heels deeper into the sand that they've been, you know, accustomed to. Yeah. But if you just let the text speak for itself and make that distinction, this is exegesis. Now, how do we perhaps synthesize this? Where we can bring in categories to help. As a pastor and not as a scholar, this is absolutely formational for my growth. Is is I am being shaped by the text in private. Mm-hmm. instead of just trying to regurgitate doctrines that I've learned in seminary right. or things that I've picked up in books. It's, it's absolutely transformational for me as well. Go ahead. Pat. I was going to say, if I could turn it back to our education philosophy at the seminary. Great. Um, I've seen a trend in seminaries to uh, reduce the level of uh, language yeah. requirement. That's right. Mm-hmm. And it's the same kind of problem that we're talking about at a seminary level is if we reduce the language requirement all the while giving more systematic theology or curriculum that is like systematic theology, a given topic, we're telling people what to believe mm. instead of teaching them how to oh, learn. That's so good. Um, so true. And, and then what happens if we've yep. learned that way in seminary, we do that with our people mm-hmm. because what we, how we learned is what we bring into the pulpit. Mm. And so um, the curriculum, the classroom, the educational philosophy is... Uh, formative. It shapes our students. It's not just information. Mm. It's formation, and it shapes our students. And so we have to, in the classroom, have the same kind of, you need to be in the text. You need to be in the tools and the languages, and you need to be wrestling with what it means and learn how to study and get to what it means, Mm. not just, hey, believe this set of doctrines. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Now, with preaching, um, what is there a balance between, uh, for the pastor, you know, application and doctrine? I mean, you know, so oftentimes, you know, the congregants are looking for the application, you know. Uh, <laughs> what do you say to that? <laughs> well, that is a, um, uh, that's a lively discussion going on right now. You have some very um, prominent pastors who, some of them don't believe in application at all mm-hmm. because of the abuse of application. Mm-hmm. Instead of saying, what does the text mean? They say, what does the text mean to me? Oh. Uh, and, and so you have this debate. Um, I think application is of utmost importance. Um, you have all of the biblical authors wrote the text in order for there to be a response to it. It wasn't just written uh, generally. It was always to bring about a response in God's people. Mm. And we could say the overall response is worship, but then there's sp- sp- specific responses, and we see that in the imperatives. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a lot of bad application that's mm-hmm. done, mm. lazy application. Uh, I'm teaching the practice of preaching class this quarter, which is really their chance to just practice. And in evaluating the applications, one of the first questions I ask is, is that the first application that came to your mind? 
Definitely. And, and right. I think for our circles, if we're, if we're strong in expository preaching, we've spent 10, 12 hours in the text. We're exhausted. We've got to what it means, but now asking the so what. Mm -hmm. uh, we go, oh, man, it's Friday. Uh, what's my first thought? I can't. Oh, here's a good application. Read your Bible and pray. <laughs> and then it's, well. <laughs> that application not... works every time, right? For Except every for that's not the application in the vast majority of the biblical text. <laughs> you know, that you bring up something that's. It's so important because would you agree with this, Ryan, that so I, I would draw a distinction between application and significance of a text. Yes. So, I mean, how you're talking about the imperatives. Now, that's easy in the Greek when we see the imperative move. But I mean, I think of things in the Old Testament mm -hmm. that you just cannot apply. You know, God tells Noah to build an ark. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we should we apply to go build an ark or Jeremiah has to go to, to get a land deed right before the Babylonian captivity. Almost it's, it's just typifying that that Israel has a, a deed to this land and they will be brought back type of thing. That doesn't mean you go sell your house and go buy a land, you know, get buy land somewhere else because God told Jeremiah to do that. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, I mean, I don't know, maybe you d disagree with this, but for me, it's like, I don't think every passage or every text can be applied. There's always significance mm -hmm. to appropriate. Uh, what does it teach me about God? How mm -hmm. is there a principle here? But, um, and I don't want to principalize the whole Bible either, but sometimes you are forced to those ideas where the historical context demands, I cannot apply this, but I can appropriate some lesson perhaps. I think another part of that too, I, I, I think I agree with you in what you're saying there, uh, but another part is very often we think of application as just what we do. Uh, right, right. Sometimes application is as simple as remember. Uh -huh. right, right. So Israel forgot God. Think of the old, this is what brought it to mind is so many times Israel is mm -hmm. condemned for forgetting God. And the application so many times in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, remember. That's right. So it's not doing anything, it's remembering. And why? Because what remembrance does is it gets to the level of the affections, the level of the That's motives. Right. Yeah. And so much do, doing, um, obedience flows out of, well, I'm Edwardsian, so it flows out of the motives and affections. And so in our application, in our preaching, I make a very big deal about preaching to the affections, to the motives, mm -hmm. the significance of why we do what we do, which then leads to a life of obedience. That's mm -hmm. so that's so important. Great You're point. so right, because mental application is, the, I think Romans, uh, up through ch after, up through chapter six, there's not a single imperative. I think it's Romans 6, 11 is the first imperative and it's mental, consider these things. Yes. Uh -huh. The first imperative, it's, 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 it's a mental thing to get to the emotions, get to the affections, get to the intellect. And we forget that part because you're right. Application so often gets reduced to what do I need to do as opposed to how should I think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that was kind of the thrust of my Easter sermon was. I, See what he does here? He takes it back to his <laughs> I do. That's what he wants to do. It's, it's good. I, I just had this conversation with someone at our, at our church is, is, you know, people are wanting tangible things of what do we do with the resurrection? Yeah. And right. the how do you point, apply the resurrection? Exactly. To that, and right? I think the point was we, we were thankful and we worship. And mm -hmm. so I think th that can be powerful application. And I love the point of linking that to our affections. And rem however, if I remember right, your application was read your Bible and pray more. Is that <laughs> what was. you said? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. And if you have questions, talk to Dr. Mark. Right. After. <laughs> Another question is, how has pragmatism in the church, you know, doing whatever it takes to sustain or, or grow a church, mm -hmm. How has that affected preaching? Hmm. Yeah, I think that um, my youth pastor, when I was young, said whatever, he, when I became a, a, a new youth pastor and 25 years old, he said to me, Ryan, whatever you do to bring them is what you got to do to keep them. Uh, yeah. And I, he stole that from somewhere and I don't know where, but I'm sure that wasn't yeah, unique yeah, to him. Yeah. But, but I think what happens is two things. One is people buy into worldly methods of growth that's been seen in the seeker movement that's not new i i think that there's a lot of people with genuine motives who are pastoring who they see the church shrinking they feel helpless they're fearful and they think it must be my method of expository preaching mm -hmm. i must need to try something else because this isn't working mm -hmm. so it's a lack of confidence in what scripture has said you know Paul to Timothy, preach the word, right? And he gives so much there in 2 Timothy to, to, to let him know that, hey, don't be surprised. People want their ears tickled. They, but you preach the word because this is actually what is sufficient. This is actually what changes people and delivers people because the word points to Jesus. And so when we talk about the sufficiency of scripture, 
we're talking about the sufficiency of Jesus, really. Mm. And so what happens is I think that people latch on to it's not working. My identity as a pastor is now at stake because I'm failing. And so there's a lot of jumbled up things as I talk to pastors very often, they'll falling into the influencer movement uh, to try to build their platform to because that's that's the seeker 2.0 sort of the younger generation is is, hey, this is what I want to be effective for Jesus. I want to be useful in the kingdom. This is what everybody's doing. So I need to figure out how to do this. Mm -hmm. And and so it's just what they really need is a good dose of back to Bibliology 101, the inerrancy, sufficiency, trustworthiness of Scripture because it points to Jesus and resting not their identity in their pastorate or how successful, but their identity in the finished work of their Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen That's great. I have a technical question for both of you, um, and and it really just is to satisfy my own curiosity, but it it may be helpful to listeners because I have heard this argument before. Where do we root the practice of expository preaching in Scripture? Now, you mentioned preach the word. That's mm. logos. It's not graphe. And I believe earlier he says all Scripture, graphe, is, mm-hmm. is inspired by God, speaking of the Old Testament when Paul wrote that. Is logos in that use preach the word? Is it a, I, is it a technical reference to an idea, i.e. the gospel? Or is it a reference to the graphe, the Scriptures? Yeah, I, um. I, I'll start on this. I Go mean, ahead. I have some opinions. I think contextually, immediate context, preach the word logos almost always that I can think of in Pauline epistles and Acts is specifically referring to the message of salvation through Christ. Um, so it's in a sense like preach the gospel, we would say. But that gospel message we know is in the scriptures, that special revelation. So I think it can be expanded to mean the scriptures, although graphe is not used there as you brought up. Oftentimes we use the word word and just kind of make, make it interchangeable with the Bible, but the biblical writers themselves often don't do that. They're going to they're gonna say writings, right, to when they're referring to Scripture. So preach the word, I think, immediately, and, and Ryan might have a, a, Dr. Rippey might have a different opinion here, but I, I think it's specifically the message of salvation. It is the gospel that can be expanded out at that point secondarily to the to bring so to you would say it'd be too narrow to just say that means the message of salvation i don't know if it's too narrow because well maybe but i mean it's it's it, it is contextually in it's the message of the gospel but by expansion that message of the gospel we know it through the revelation given written revelation of the uh, in the scriptures so dr Riffey, we'll we'll pass that to you but the second question is where would we re- root the practice of expository preaching in scripture if it's not in that passage uh, are there other passages that we could go to or other implications that we could say, here would be a great implication to say this is why that should be the pastor's regular yeah, practice? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think to the first question about the word you have in, in chapter 3, before he gets to chapter 4, verse 2, he's saying all Scripture is inspired by God. Yeah. And he has in mind the Old Testament mm-hmm. uh, as he's telling Timothy, mm-hmm. and it's that same Scripture that's he's saying preach the word. And I think the connection is... Uh, if we were to to take the teaching of Jesus about Luke 24, beginning with Moses, all these scriptures point to me. Mm. Paul's understanding, Timothy, you are preaching the gospel. This gospel was preached beforehand in the Old Testament. All of the scriptures are pointing to Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's why we're Christ-centered in our preaching. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the Trinitarian, per- God the Father and God the Spirit are the most Christ-centered persons in the universe. Uh, the Father says, this is my son, listen to him. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and the Spirit's whole ministry in this new covenant age is to shine a floodlight on Jesus mm-hmm. as the paraclete. And so um, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. You search the scriptures, you think in them you have life, but it's these that testify of me. So so I'm giving you a little more of my Christ-centeredness uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, understanding here. But you have even Ezra, you know, when they rebuilt right. the, the tabernacle, he's explaining That's the right. meaning of the scriptures Nehemiah to the people. chapter 8. Yeah. yeah. Eight, verse 8, um, that's what I was thinking. And, and then you have uh, the book of Hebrews is our first sermon, and it's a book of the Bible. Hmm. I, I read a fascinating um, academic work that argued that he, the book of Hebrews is an exposition of Psalm 110. Oh. Hmm. And um, I'm going to be doing some further writing this uh, summer on it and, and hopefully publishing it in the, later in August. But it's fascinating to take the book of Hebrews as an example of expository preaching. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what you see there is you don't see a micro exegesis. 
You see, yeah. you see an exegesis of Psalm 110. You see going to other passages, forming e- expositional theology from other parts of the Psalms. But this main emphasis of Jesus is better is coming from Psalm 110. Yeah, yeah. He's the one seated at the right hand of the mm-hmm. Father. Wow, yeah. that's very interesting. Yeah. I just want to get to this poll really quick. Cause, you know, obviously, the, you know, we're assuming here, you know, that the Bible is the sole authority. And it, it's just amazing. In a 22 Gallup poll on values and beliefs, now they pulled over a thousand American adults. They're surveyed. They're asked, is the Bible the actual word of God to be taken literally? <clears throat> or two, merely an inspired book of God not to be taken literally? Three, simply an ancient man-made book of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts. And of those surveyed, only 20% of American adults said it was the literal word of God, which for that poll was a record low. Uh, Bringing it down even further, of that 20%, 30% of those identifying as Protestants, these are Protestants, said the Bible was the literal word of God, which means 70% of Protestants said it wasn't Mm -hmm. or had some other category. Hmm. And of those who are evangelicals and born again, 40% said it was the literal word of God. When so... I only have to ask, I mean, the congregants sitting in churches, uh, so many of them may or may not even believe that the word they're holding is the literal word of God. What is contributing to this view of Scripture, and are our pastors partly responsible? I mean, what's going on? I like to blame the seminaries, not the pastors. Yeah. Or the scholars. How about the... <laughs> All right, I like, to blame, I like to blame to the seminary president <laughs> yeah, also yeah, a yeah, pastor. Yeah. <laughs> He's got two shoulders. He's yeah, to blame yeah, doubly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got one. What, yeah, two yeah, shoulders. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, he's got three. <laughs> yeah. Two last time I yeah, saw. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. What I a... started thinking. I'm like, wait, are shoulders? At, oh, is that one? Uh, I'm gonna stop right there. Yeah. <laughs> Two shoulders. Thank you, Dr. Marsh. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, We're yeah, not yeah. getting into sermon illustrations. <laughs> yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. My PhD is obviously not in biology. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, that's a large question. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, so many things contribute to that. Mm. The, the lack of, the, the decline of Christianity um, yeah. in the United States as a whole. Um, so many people I speak to in Northern California, they never even met a Christian. Mm. You know, I, I'm at this point now where it, uh, I don't even have, um, you know, sort of the disenfranchised, disenchanted Christian, you know, grew up in church but don't mm-hmm. like it anymore. Yeah. I'm pe- speaking to people at the coffee shop that are like, wow, you're a pastor? Wow, that's a Bible? I've never seen a Bible. Wow. Like, like uh, it's like a dinosaur. It's like, wow. uh, didn't yeah. know it existed. Like you're anymore. from a different planet. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. which has been from an even you know evangelism standpoint fascinating to me because it's different kinds of open doors so i think there's that i think that pastors are to blame pastors who buy into methods of church growth and and felt needs kind of preaching that is you know uh, very pragmatic very much uh, here's 10 t- tips to help your marriage that none of them are rooted in scripture they're just the wisdom of yep. the world type stuff if if we show functionally that, oh, we say the Bible's the word of God, but when in your life what you need is not the word, you need the wisdom of the world, uh, we're teaching our people hmm. through repetition and uh, uh, that, that really this isn't trustworthy. It's not the, this is more uh, trustworthy. And so, hmm. so discipleship is lacking, um, which falls on the pastors. Uh, hmm teaching is lacking, understanding. Um, But yeah, I mean, that's such a large, and and you know how those polls go. It's Protestants generally, if we're talking about liberal theology, uh, they don't believe the Bible's the word of God for all sorts of Mm -hmm. textual critical reasons. And so... But even among evangelical and born again, it was a little disturbing. That's disturbing. Yeah, yeah. That stat you said, 40% of those who identify as As evangelical evangelical born again. That means 60% of evangelicals, the majority of evangelicals, according to that Gallup poll, do not not believe the Bible's word of God. Now, historically, to identify as an evangelical, at least in the last century, is to start with a high view of Scripture. Uh, Dr. Rippey, we had the ETS uh, Far West uh, regional meeting yesterday. And the, you, I don't think you were there for it, but at the end, um, uh, Dr. McClendon, Justin McClendon, he did a president's address, and it was on, he called it Francis Schaeffer in the Negative World. Mm. And he was speaking on uh, Francis Schaeffer, and Francis Schaeffer's last book, uh, 1984, right before he died, it was called The um, uh, um, 
uh, the great evangelical disaster. And Schaefer had, you know, he put a line in the sand saying, he, I mean, he had his finger on the pulse of evangelical culture. He's like, if we don't hold to a full view of scripture, in his mind, inspiration, corollary is it's inerrant, it's inspired, it's all sufficient, all those things, then if that's the watershed moment. Then everything else is just going to like a, like a house of cars just going to fall apart, right? So you have to start with your view of scripture to be identified as, as evangelical. And then this says 60% of evangelical survey do not believe the Bible is the word of God or it's or that it's inerrant, it's, you can't take it as literally. That is very disturbing, and, and I think you're right, Ryan, to be able to place some blame on leaders and, profess, uh, and pastors, especially in our American culture that look to other things, celebrityism, yep. you know, um, platform building, all these things, and they should, be, they should really be devoted to understanding the Scriptures to equip their people in the Scriptures first, especially if you're going to call yourself an, an evangelical, right? Yeah, I, I mean— for me, one of the, the foundational presuppositions to be an, an expositor is believing, I think, that the Bible is the Word of God. I agree. I, I made a joke earlier. Yes, I do think that things that begin in seminaries trickle down into the local churches. But I think largely to blame if this is a true statistic, and it is a big question, but I would say it's you can walk into so many churches today and you can you can very quickly discern what they believe about the Bible. How do they treat their Sunday service? How do they approach preaching? That doesn't mean all of us that believe the Bible's inerrant are going to come to the same doctrinal conclusions. I can go to a Presbyterian church and, mm -hmm. and see by how they're treating Scripture, by how their people are responding. Are their people wanting to be obedient? Or is everything just a big joke? Is everything yeah. just fun? Mm -hmm. And I, I, There's a church near us who I watched a sermon, and at the beginning of almost every sermon, the guy gets up and says, our church is a fun church, and... We're not those those stiff guys that never laugh. And, and he essentially is assaulting expository preaching, and the entire service is a joke. And the life of the congregation mm -hmm. is not a, it's not a congregation where people are experiencing transformation yeah. by the Spirit of God, that the attitude, Word of God. That attitude is going to spill right over it to the people. It spills over. And you, yeah. So I do think that churches and pastors are largely to blame. Let, um, me, let, let me ask this, and, and, and Doc Rippey, you'll be able to speak into this, because I'm looking at the statistic, Chris, that you read, and it's very yeah. disturbing. I can't get over this. 40% of those identifying as evangelicals say the Bible's literal word of God. So 60% don't. Um, why, there's why a statistic. Do Many of them fall into the category of they think it's inspired, but... Uh, yeah, in not everything should be taken literally. So, so they probably would give away like on the seven day creation. Right. Okay. Wait. Wait. Yeah. Right. I get it. Uh, but this kind of harmonizes with a statistic that I've read from uh, the Global Center for Christianity at Gordon Conwell Seminary that ninety five percent of evangelical pastors have not had any formal training. Mm. That means only five percent mm. okay. of evangelical pastors have been formally trained. Sixty okay. percent of evangelical people are saying the Bible is not the literal word of God. Mm. Perhaps the academy's not to blame. It's real. That means you know, the majority of these people are right. perhaps from pastors that haven't been formally trained. Now, I'm not saying you need to have formal education to be a pastor, but the statistics, if these are anywhere accurate, it seems to be saying those who don't have some type of formal training, and I'm not saying all formal training is good because there's a lot of bad ones out there, but this is why we, we, we're part of seminaries, why, you know, Ryan is a college of, uh, of one and uh, president of one, and, and I'm a professor of New Testament one. I'm, I, I'm, deep, I, I'm, very, I'm very convicted on inductive, formal theological training to start with the languages, to learn how to inductively read the text, to go into expository preaching. Let's, can we camp here for a minute? Because I'd love of to course. hear And this Ryan's answers the question I had about pursuing formal education, but mm -hmm. go ahead. I'd love to hear Ryan's. Ryan and I had an opportunity to talk for a couple hours yesterday. I really have enjoyed getting to know Ryan. I'm excited about his ministry and all that is going on in Vallejo. It's exciting to hear what's in the, going on at Cornerstone. Um, one of the things that we talked about yesterday was I came from a tradition that did not encourage formal seminary training. Now, from my perspective, and I would say this to all of the pastors listening, prospective pastors or pastors that don't have formal training, what has helped me in pursuing formal training is that it forces me to think through things I would not have otherwise thought through. Right. Especially, I'm challenged by getting a formal education. That benefit to my congregation is immense right. because I become a better thinker. I become mm -hmm. a more careful expositor. I'm learning to handle the Word of God better. For the two of you, 
PhDs, heavily involved in the academy, seminary professors. What would you say is why pastors should pursue formal training? Yeah, we, I mean, we are fully convinced of that up at Cornerstone, and, and this pastor professor model hopes to teach students, give a reason why this is so important. Um, you know, our four distinctives as a seminary, these core values, these foundational commitments are Christ-centeredness, pastor-professor model, mentorship in the classroom, and local church engagement. And I think that some of the anti-intellectualism is a overreaction to the ivory tower mm -hmm. uh, tadpole syndrome of a big head, no body. Why would I want that? That's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think some of it is access because of money uh, and cost. Yeah. Some of it is God calls pastors who maybe were terrible students in high school. That's me. <laughs> like, I'm a D student. D for degree. I still am D for a D. degree, baby. Yeah, I, 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 I say regularly in our church, C's like. get degrees. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, my seminary says B's, so I can't. Yeah, yeah, right. Anymore, yeah. So. Um, and so I think what, what seminaries can do to help offset that is show the, the benefit and usefulness of seminary education. They mm -hmm. can model it well by having your professors connected deeply with the local church, then they're seeing that what they're learning is not disconnected from their weekly experience. Love it. And so, so you have this need for education. There's a number of trajectories. Now, my PhD, my minor was church history. I teach church history at Cornerstone, so I always am tempted to think of history. So. There are certain traditions, whether it's uh, the Baptist tradition, a uh, strand of anti-intellectualism, because they were the excluded from education. You know, if you go back to London, uh, the particular Baptists, they were not allowed to go to Cambridge and Oxford because they weren't Anglicans. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you have, you've been, you've, they've been rejected, so now they reject education in some ways. And that's not true across the board. I'm generalizing, but you have it in the, uh, with the rise of the charismatic movement in the 20th century, here in California especially, uh -huh. Azusa Street, and, and yep. then uh -huh. you have all of these traditions in California, um, whether it's Assemblies of God, Calvary Chapels, whatever, that basically say you don't need education mm -hmm. to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. True statement, but why wouldn't you? It's kind of like saying, well, you don't need, you can just watch YouTube videos to be a plumber. True statement, that could happen, and you could get an education but don't you want to be excellent? Yeah, my, my wife eats cereal without milk. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> does she really? She does. I'm sorry. Oh, that honey, explains so much about Allison. <laughs> Ryan, I'm sorry. Keep going. <laughs> and so think about the biblical languages. I, I hear this a lot, kind of the, why do I need to learn Greek? Uh, well, if you talk to any Greek student who's ever learned Greek, you don't hear them saying, I don't need Greek. The only people saying, I don't need Greek, are the people who don't know Greek. Right, mm. right. And I don't mean that to be disparaging. That's just sort of a, uh, a Dr. Schreiner at ETS yesterday made this same comment in the Q&A that now if you learn the Greek, if you learn the languages, you're not dependent on others. You can actually see with your own eyes what the text is saying. Mm. Uh, if you don't learn Greek, now you're dependent upon the scholarship of others in commentaries, in lexicons. You're at their mercy. You're at their mercy. You don't even know if they're accurate or not. And if you mm. choose a poor scholar to follow, then you're going to then bring that error right. into the pulpit. I, I've only had two Greek classes, and I'm horrible. And it's obvious. <laughs> yeah. And you probably failed those two Greek classes. And too. Corey has, <laughs> he comes to church with his Greek New Testament. Right. He sits in the front row with his right, Greek right. New Testament. Pointing at it while he's trying to parse a word up there from the pulpit. And then when I'm done, he pulls me aside and, you know, <laughs> corrects me a couple ways. But Corey said that to me years ago, and uh, I'm not done with my Greek education. I, I, I don't want to say that. But you're it, actually it, doing really well, man. Well, I appreciate that. But it 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 was it really convicted me, because Corey, I think the way you phrased it to me was you said that you're you're always going to be dependent on these other scholars. And you can never actually be critical. You That's can't. Right. You can't have a critical opinion. You don't know if they're right or wrong. You just. It gotta, was a. Yeah. It was a helpful corrective you gave me a couple of years ago because I would, at times, assume myself as being critical, and I realized I can't be critical. Yeah. I am totally at the mercy. The good news is, is I've I have friends who've pointed me to great resources, um, so I know enough to be dangerous. This goes. This goes. But back, it's a great point. I'm this sorry. goes back to a point that Ryan made earlier: is that seminaries are so tempted, if. 
you, you cut the language programs because that's more palpable to get students. Right. Yes. They think language, oh, that's too much. So it's too many seminaries just drop that out. And then you get too many theologians in this cage stage that don't know how to exegete the text, you know, from the languages. I'm, I'm very convicted. When I first started learning the languages, uh, A.T. Robertson, that great Greek grammarian in the 20th century, he said something. Out, it always stuck with me. I've probably quoted it here before, but his whole thing was, you know, um, the Greek New Testament is the New Testament. All else is translation. You know, so if you're really exegeting and expositing the word, you have to know some, not be an expert, but you have to have some type of working firsthand relationship with the actual Hebrew and Greek of, of the text. And I want to go back to that question that was just brought up because Ryan's answer was awesome. And I appreciated it from a, a professor standpoint that you want to be grounded in the local church. And I know that's the model you have at mm-hmm. Cornerstone where the, the professors are also pastors. And I love that because you have one church and one foot in the academy, one foot in the church pastors or professors should be grounded in the local church. I'm very convicted about that. That's why I, I love being at Revolve Bible Church and being a member there, Shannon and I. Um, and while I'm remembering it, that's so funny you said that about Allison with dry cereal. <laughs> Come to find out, I thought that was weird at first. Shannon does the exact same. My wife does the same thing. She'll have like cereal in a bowl and just pick We've at that. We've been married for almost <laughs> 16 weird. years and it is an ongoing debate. Yeah, it, it doesn't they're very make similar. sense to me. Yeah. That's Anyways, to, anyway. to go back and to get that out of the way. So... Um, but I want to take it from a from an academic standpoint. I would say we also need more pastors involved in the academy, mm-hmm. right? Uh, again, the statistic: if if ninety five percent of evangelical pastors have not been formally trained, and how much bad theology is out there in the name of evangelicalism, the academy can help. So I'm all about. That's why we have this pastor scholar podcast, you know, and and having Ryan here from uh, from Cornerstone, that pastor professor model. We're big at it at Southern California Seminary as well to bridge that gap. We need more exegetes, better scholarly minded pastors behind the pulpit, um, as well as more shepherd shepherd hearted uh, professors behind I, the I podium. Called, right. Yesterday we went to the far west. Uh, uh, region, ETS, Evangelical Theological Society, Far West Region. Corey currently serves as the vice president. Actually, the president now I'm the president. Year. Sorry, you're not <laughs> the president. Mr. First Pre- time I get to say Mi- that. Mr. President. <laughs> Which is awesome because the vice president has to handle everything, you know. I, but. but I called Corey last night as I, I was driving home, and one of the things that I noted Now I get to chill for next time. <laughs> That's pretty nice. Uh, is, is that it was an academic conference, uh-huh. and, but it was so refreshing to hear the pastoral heart that mm. bleeded through. Mm-hmm. Um, I heard that from Ryan in our conversation and in the paper that you presented. It was phenomenal. Um, and that's one of the reasons I love both of you guys is because, yeah, you do have a heart for the local church. One of the questions I think is interesting, as a, as a, I think it's important to say that the, I know you, Corey, I don't want to speak for you, Ryan, but the reason that you're so passionate about the local church, because the local church is the only institution that Jesus promised to build. The local church is the, the, the venue through which God has chosen to change the world and propagate the gospel mm-hmm. through. There's a challenge, I think, as a scholar to submit to an elder who, Corey, you have more degrees in Fahrenheit and more degrees than me. Uh, you serve as a deacon at our church. You help me with my theology. You help me with my exposition. Regularly, I'll call Corey on a Saturday night trying to figure out how does this conjunction fit or am I a, is this a right type of mm-hmm. approach to this mm-hmm. text? Poor Corey picks up the phone like nine o'clock at night. Which I so appreciate. How many pastors <laughs> do that? The fact yeah. that you're actually struggling with a conjunction. Mm-hmm. I love mm-hmm. that. Uh, but I, I'll, I, I, I just, uh, I'm thankful for that. But my question is, how is it difficult for you guys? Now, Ryan, I know you're also church planting right now. You've planted a church. It, when you're interacting with a pastor, say Corey, like me, who has less education than you, um, and you're you're constantly saying, I submit to my shepherds, and you're the most educated guy at our church. I love that heart because you're not rooting the authority. You're not saying I have authority by the nature of my degrees. You're saying my authority is the word of God, and I'm submitting yeah. to the word of God, and this is what the word of God says, and it's not my degrees that give me authority mm-hmm. over people. I've been submitting freely to you up until I found out you're a D student, <laughs> even through high school. Well, I'm so a B know. student now. <laughs> now you're B I think student. I have a 3.65 right no, now. No, this so. is a, a, to your to your to your question, Ryan. So I think of SCS, even part of our mission statements, we 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 equip the local church. A, a seminary, by by definition, is a parachurch ministry. We That's come right. alongside the church. We support the local church, as you said. 
God is using the church in this particular economy to promulgate his gospel. I mean, it's, he's changing the world through the church. Christ is building his church. We support the local church. Seminaries who don't do that, who don't, who are totally detached from the local church, I think there's some red flags there. There's some good seminaries I can think of that are that are that are independent in that sense. But there's always some little bit of suspicion in my mind, like, why is that? They should be supporting and submitting to the local church. It is the church that the manifold wisdom of God has made known, Ephesians 3, 9 through 11. Um, so for me, it's based on conviction, based on my understanding of Scripture. I submit to the elders at our church, as any congregant should, because I trust the leadership that God's got in place and that God has actually called you to be the pastor of myself and my wife and all the elders and pa our pastors at RBC um, it's never based on a degree, how many degrees we've earned. It is based on the correct ecclesiology that comes out of Scripture saying, these are shepherds, under shepherds God has called to pastor their people, and I'm privileged to be one of those people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it should never be based on degrees. And, and I'll, before Ryan speaks, I will say I have been in churches where because I happen to be more educated than the pastor, it seems like we're kept at bay, like at arm's length, like there's suspicion toward us when it's like, there are so many PhDs in churches that feel out of place. They need shepherding too. And then it just becomes all too easy to resort to, resort to our ivory tower because we're nobody, want nobody can communicate with us anyways or they're intimidated by us. So we'll just go do our research by ourselves. When PhDs and scholars and churches, they need shepherding just like anybody else. And I'm not there. You made a joke earlier about, you know, I'm there critical with my Greek text with you. You're not. I know, and I know yeah, what you meant yeah. by that. But obviously, I'm there learning, and I'm being fed the gospel week in and week out. And so I, my wife and I both need that. So thankfully, we're at a church where it's actually easy to submit to the leadership, you yeah, know, um, at our church. I think that just to piggyback off of that, when you are connected to the local church as an academic you see that maturity in the Christian life is not merely how much you know. Um, hmm. I think of deacons that I grew up with that were the godliest men I knew hmm. who served the flock, who they weren't there to put their name in lights. They were there to serve the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, you see uh, your, your men and women in the church who are loving one another, who are being that priesthood of believers that Peter talks about, mm -hmm. dispensers of grace into the lives of one another, mm -hmm. stewards of the manifold grace of God, whether it's speaking or serving gifts. Mm -hmm. You see life in the church. This, uh, The church is exhibit A of what God's doing to, to sum up all things in Jesus and to make all things new. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this dichotomy happened. Um, I, we don't have time to go through all of the history, but it happened. And it needs to be restored. Mm -hmm. the, the earliest theologians were pastors. Yeah. Right. Augustine, Basil, Gregory, they were all pastors. Uh, Calvin, Luther, you just keep going. Right. And yeah. so the pastor theologian, pastor scholar um, desire is a good desire. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that every pastor will be a PhD, but they should all be theologians, mm -hmm. students of the word, yeah. students of God. Mm -hmm. And that restoring of that then leads to robust health in the life of the church. Mm. Um, lack of education leads to insecurities very often. Yes. And so insecurities lead to, um, uh, they lead to sin in the church by leaders who make it their agenda rather than humility of saying, well, I might be right or wrong on this doctrine or this practice. Um, and just like anything, when we're learning, we don't even know what we don't know. And, and very much getting some theological training. It's it's why I think our Bible college portion of our school, which is like a school of ministry for people who don't have a college education, is giving those same tools, is because we're trying to equip the local church in a way to instill humility and a love of learning, loving God with all your mind yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and heart and soul, and that um, as we are renewing our minds, we're being transformed. We're we're better worshipers. We're we're serving the body of Christ, and and uh, I agree with you that we don't want um, insecurities from pastors to push academics away, to retreat to ivory tower. And so, uh, you know, it's it's really wonderful when it's paired together in That's the right. local church. Mm -hmm. What would you say to pastors? Sorry, Chris. What would you say? I, I'm just here for a show. Yeah. <laughs> what would What would you say to pastors that that are feeling insecure 
about developing relationships with some scholars. I, what would you? What, what encouragement would you give? I know I have been so benefit with my friendship with scholars. They've pulled me up. Mm -hmm. What would you say to a pastor who, who maybe needs would would be greatly helped to to develop that relationship? I would start with um, just who they are in Christ, reminding them their identity right. is in their union with Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, that I would I would start with it that your insecurities, your fears of of not knowing, um, that's not directly tied to your call to ministry. Mm -hmm. If if you've been placed into ministry by the laying on of hands of the presbytery, you've been sent out by a local church, you've you're you're serving in the body of Christ, you've been called in this manner. Uh, you don't have to be insecure about that just because you have a lack of knowledge in mm. certain areas. And so it really is practicing greatness in the kingdom, humility, being a servant of all to say, I want to I want to better equip my people. So I need to be equipped um, to your point earlier. Seminaries don't ordain. They don't send. They don't plant churches. The local church does all That's of right. that. Yeah. Seminaries don't disciple. I was making this distinction between mentorship and discipleship. Mm -hmm. Properly speaking, discipleship happens in the local church. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, Seminaries but, don't practice church discipline. That's right. Needed. right. Yeah. yeah. And so um, seeing the seminary as a resource for tools, the best tools of the trade. Um, I know it's a worn illustration, but um, using a hammer to screw in a screw or you know, using the wrong tool for the job, it may get the job done, but it wasn't the intended purpose of that tool. So biblical languages, hermeneutics and exposition, church history, systematic theology, pastoral ministry, uh, biblical counseling, all of these things are tools to help the pastor love and shepherd the flock. The goal is loving and shepherding the flock like our chief shepherd, Jesus. What would you say, though, to a pastor or uh, one who wants to be a uh, earth feels that they're called to be who either can't afford mm. to go to seminary or um, mm. simply don't have Good access question. to seminary. Yeah. yeah, so our model is we don't do any online training. Everything's local. Mm. Uh, that's not always the best resource for certain pastors. We live in a day and age where we are blessed with an abundance of ways to be equipped, uh, whether it's there are free online resources to learn the languages, um, there are free tools that are available, uh, getting connected to a local scholar. I regularly mentor people that aren't coming to my seminary. If they want to go take me out and buy me a cup, a cappuccino, I'm willing to talk whatever they want to talk about. Um, and so I think making those connections. People and, take me out to coffee to keep me from talking. Yeah. talking. Well, I, bribe you I, I will give you, you this up. tip that if you want to talk to an academic, find out what they wrote their dissertation that's right. on. That's right. Because nobody reads it. That's exactly and you right. ask them, <laughs> ask them that's right. what their dissertation yeah. is. And just let them go. That's let exactly them go. right. <laughs> <laughs> we need excuses to talk about our dissertation. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of, I've not read your dissertation, but I've and Nobody heard... else has either. That's the point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> it's great from a, a a friend of ours. That's right, and could, and it's published on. They can get people can get a copy of it on Amazon. Can you tell us what mm -hmm. it's called? This is the role of God in the Trinity, right? Uh, it's not technically. It's oh, it's uh, the doctrine. It's it's a paterology, oh, a doctrine the of the person and work of the first person of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. okay. So the title is that God may be all in all. So uh, I made the foolish decision. Uh, not foolish, but in, when you're trying to do a PhD, you want to narrow your scope and limit it. And I chose the first person of the Trinity. So <laughs> pretty narrow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, the story of that is, is my um, my theology proper professor had read Tom Smale's book, Forgotten Father, back in the 90s. And when I was taking him, said, hey, nobody's writing on God the Father. So uh. write me a paper on it. I had no, this was 2004. I knew nothing about it. I wrote this paper. Then I started digging in and there hasn't been a published work on the first person of the Trinity other than Tom Smale's book and, and another one by Kessler called God Our Father. And so then um, I was able to, to pursue this. So I did sort of a biblical theological from eternity past to eternity future. Huh. Uh, person and work of the Father. Isn't that interesting? The, um, the irony of that, because the Father is such a huge category, and yet 
Pterology is just, it's like not, there's hardly anyone addressing it. That's correct. And so you actually hit a niche, which is needed. Yeah, and, and the reason why is because since the fourth century, uh, there there weren't attacks on the father. Uh, you don't have atheism back then. You have polytheism. So everybody understood the first person to be God. All of the controversies were over the deity of the son and the deity right. of the spirit. So because the doctrine wasn't attacked, it didn't have to be defended and further defined. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. uh, I found a wonderful quote from Gerald Bray, which was in my first chapter that since the fourth century, no one's written on the father as a person in his own right. Wow. Um, wow. And I thought that's the Gerald Bray is until the 21st story. century. Yeah, right? yeah, right, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so just getting back um, and, and I'll just go around and uh, Pastor Ryan will be with you. What would you say, what is the best way or how should we go about reclaiming the pulpit for God's glory? I, I think reclaiming the pulpit for God's glory begins with a, um, a dogged commitment to the sufficiency and inerrancy of Scripture. Um, even if you as a pastor don't have formal training or if you're a pastor like me who's in the process of getting formal training, what, what, what makes the pulpit thunder is the word of God rightly mm. divided. And committing to that, God will use you. God will, you'll get something right. I don't get everything right, but I get something right. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and that's where the power in preaching is. The power in preaching is not in my illustrations. As important as application is, it's not even in my applications. The power of preaching is the spirit of God taking the word of God and preaching a better sermon in the hearts of people than I can to people's ears. And I am amazed week after week after week, people that will come up to me and tell me what they got out of the sermon. And I don't even remember making that point. Mm -hmm. And it's because the spirit of God was applying it to that person's life and transforming them. And then to see that flesh itself out in the, in the life of the church. And as a pastor, that's what I want. I, and I, that's why I really appreciated meeting Ryan yesterday and the talks that we had. Because Ryan is a, is a, scar, is a scholar, but he, he wants to see the truth get to the heart and work its way out in transformation and affection for God. And um, so I would just say start with an, a dogged commitment to the inerrancy and sufficiency mm -hmm. of God's word. Um, I would say that from a pastoral perspective. How about you, Clark? Uh, you know, I can't do much to, to build on that. A hundred percent agree with what Ryan said. Um, for me, maybe the academic side, and this is not academic as in quote unquote, so this is for every Christian inductively, everything boils down to hermeneutics for mm -hmm. me. You know, before we get to any theological position, there's an interpretation that led to that. That interpretive method is what matters. So as I teach a, a consistent grammatical historical hermeneutic, hermeneutics then leads inductively to that greater goal. Um, for, you know, I, I wrote a book on it, being biblically literate, actually growing in the, our, the awareness of God's presence by exegeting the meaning of the text. So to reclaim the pulpit, it has to start at that inductive level of correct hermeneutics, leading to become biblically literate to then be able to expound the word. Mm -hmm. How about you, Dr. Rick? I would say uh, echo a hearty amen to everything I've heard. Um, maybe the only thing I would say yes and would be the sufficiency of Scripture, uh, as I said earlier, points to the sufficiency of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, a spirit-empowered pulpit, uh, is one that is robustly Christ-centered. The Spirit's ministry is to glorify the Son. Amen. And and when we talk about Christ-centeredness, we're not talking about how many times Jesus is mentioned right. or trying to find him where he isn't right. in some allegorical right. method to your hermeneutics right. point. Mm -hmm. Rather, what it's showing is how all of the excellencies and attributes and perfections of our Savior fit the needs of our people perfectly. Hmm. And so as we take the text and it reveals the glory of our Savior mm. and we deliver it to our people in an expository manner so they can see that what we're saying is what the text is saying, mm. then they are grown in shape. Like Paul, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ right. to every woman as well, yeah. that what we're doing is we're, we're showing how Jesus fits their need perfectly and he's an all-sufficient savior and he's supreme seated at the right hand of the father ruling and reigning with the greatest authority so that our problems are not on the throne our government's not on the throne uh, our financial system's not on the throne Jesus is on the throne Amen. and it causes our people to live with boldness and confidence and draw near to the throne of grace mm -hmm. and receive grace and mercy to help in our time of need
we need to do an episode on that the fact that the Holy Spirit is Christocentric. That's true. Mm-hmm. We need to do an episode yeah. on that. That's, in you. fact, well going to your part, yeah. your your paper from yesterday, that was part of the the ideas of how even you know the Father sending the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. I like how you put it. Shines a floodlight mm-hmm. on the Son. Uh, I stole that from Packer. Keep in step with the course. Spirit. That, you everything know, like, good you say, I, I sound like another book. Just like <laughs> he preaches. <laughs> everything what, good I say, I stole from Corey. That's <laughs> what scholars do. You know, I just I, got let from me. Someone else. I'm footnoting now. That, <laughs> right. I took that from Packer. Yeah. Keep in step with no, the Spirit. In all seriousness, excellent. And and, and I'm, before you close out, Chris, says, yes. thank you, Ryan, for joining us. Um, yes. You actually Thanks for having me. You actually helped model the idea of pastor scholar. You're you are. A, a president of college seminary, a scholar, but also a churchman at heart. And you had being at ETS yesterday was wonderful hosting you and having you there and us having those conversations and us together. Um, it models the idea of being a scholar committed to the local church that's also committed to academics. And these things can actually go together. And um, we try to model that. And you Thank you so that. much for having me. It's yeah. been a great delight. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Rafi. Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you for tuning in.